like to just uh, acknowledge we're on Jara people's country. Um, and Jara people have been performing um, ceremony, ritual, uh, agrarianism, and ecological economy for many thousands of years on this very land. And there is much to learn from Jara people. Um, I'd like to welcome you all uh, to the town hall um, in Dalesford, if you're from further afield. Yeah, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Mitch um, Boney, um, Beck's partner. Um, he must be out with Beck at the moment. Um, he's a um, Gamilaroi man from New South Wales. Um, I'd like to also welcome uh, and acknowledge any other Aboriginal um, people here t tonight, and also to um, acknowledge uh, uh, non-Indigenous elders here as well, um, Dallas, Nikki, and Sue in particular. Um, Sue Dennett um, and Maureen uh, Corbett started Hepburn Relocalization Network about, or at least 10 years ago, and we've been having these sorts of gigs, um, small and large, for the last 10 years, film nights, really great spe uh, speaking events, lots of um, community food gathering and sharing of knowledges um, together. Lots of things, big heroic things and little intimate things. Um, g'day. Um, So um, the, the, the flowers down here of the wattle and the wild apple uh, really, um, apart from their great beauty and their seasonality, they're out all throughout the Shire at the moment. The wattles are just finishing. I also want to speak, to use Donna Haraway's language, um, it's also a sign signifier for me of staying with the trouble. Um, with indigenous ecology and newcomer uh, economy, such as wild apples naturalizing here, there's, um, there's politics, there's imperialism, and there's, of course, great beauty and, there's, and sustenance. So there's trouble in this arrangement. And I, I, just, I would like to bring that here. We are all subjects and agents of imperialism to some degree. Um, and part of bringing together um, the speakers for tonight is to really, uh, again, to call on Haraway to really stay with the trouble of, of where, how, how welded we are um, in this significant imperialist moment. Um, and what I mean by that, of course, is uh, the Romans, for example, brought the apple to England and... and uh, the English took the apples to America, um, and apples have emplaced or naturalized around the world. So the Romans also brought, uh, or Roman law was brought to this country by the British in the forms of, form of terra nullius. And so our rental agreements and our mortgages still very much sit on that trouble. And um, uh, so, yeah, it's... While it's a beautiful flower arrangement, there is trouble in this flower arrangement. And I'd really like us to um, be able to stay with the trouble tonight and uh, um, build our questions around and our thoughts and our participation when it gets to question time around some of the more, um, how are we going to respond to the trouble of imperialism and, and the capitalist scene to call on Haraway again. So I'd like to uh, introduce uh, or invite Tammy from Australian Food Sovereignty Alliance um, to give, uh, to first up, give some perspective of the political work that her and her organisation are doing. Tammy is the president of that organisation. And yeah, just to get us up to speed with uh, some of the political um, problems that we're facing at the moment in terms of 
the industrial food complex um, and industrial culture generally. Um, and then uh, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to, uh, to um, Eva, who's going to facilitate the, the conversations tonight. Um, and we're going to, she's going to introduce uh, our three guest speakers and then um, draw out more from them before she draws uh, out questions from yourselves. So uh, welcome again, everybody. Welcome latecomers. <laughs> Um, and uh, over to you, Tammy. Thanks, Patrick. So, as Patrick said, I'm the president of the Australian Food Sovereignty Alliance, which started in 2010 as a reaction to the introduction of a national food plan uh, by the federal government, which was business as usual, support supermarkets and big industrial ag, uh, which was later shelved anyway. But a group of, of activists, academics mostly, came together and said, why don't we write a people's food plan? instead of the National Food Plan. And they hosted uh, kitchen table conversations all over the country. Uh, they reckon they met with about 600 people who contributed to the ultimate document, the People's Food Plan, which is on our website. And uh, when I think about where we are today, eight years later, the AFSA was then incorporated in 2012, and um, I'll tell you where we got to now. That was sort of the response against what's wrong with the system. That's, what, that's why AFSA started, because people knew we needed to respond, not just constantly have outrage, but actually collectivize and do something about it. That was, as I said, mostly academics. Slowly, farmers started getting involved, such as myself, and by 2014, I was president. And through, uh, I guess, largely through me getting more involved and in telling other farmers, come on, you need to be collectivizing in this space. You're the ones who are growing the food properly. We need you involved and your voices need to be uh, brought up higher. And, and we were getting more involved in the international movement at the time, which is led by farmers. The global food sovereignty movement is a, is a farmers and peasants movement um, and indigenous peoples movement. The uh, Australian one, as I said, started as academic, became more farmer to the extent that last week, we had our annual food sovereignty convergence and we introduced constitutional amendments which have now made AFSA explicitly farmer-led. So we have to have a farmer president. In practice, we always have. Um, we have to have at least four committee members who are farmers, which is not a majority, but it is a significant proportion of the committee. And any decisions being made by AFSA that have a potential for a material impact on farmers and their livelihoods will be made by farmers, and the farmers themselves determine which issues those are. That brings us much more in line with the global movement that says farmers' voices have to be privileged because they've been oppressed for so long. And so the two key things, I guess, that we work on, and we still have academics on our committee, by the way, and I'm a former academic, so I have some sympathy for that position. Um, but yeah, and so we now are what we call farmers and allies. And we say, if you're, not a, if you're not a farmer, you obviously should be an ally. And if you're not an ally, why not? Um, we can't leave farmers in silos to solve problems. They're going to need all of the support from the rest of the actors in the food system as we possibly can. Uh, the two key things, I guess, that we're focusing on that are barriers to the growth of the agroecological farming movement are um, the legislative hurdles, legislation that's been set up largely to manage industrial agriculture, sometimes to protect it, sometimes to protect us from it. But those, uh, those legislation, uh, that legislation is not supportive of small scale farming. It's scale inappropriate. It's very burdensome for the kind of scale that we're talking about of the way we want to produce food. So we're systematically working with governments at all levels to change legislation to make our farms more viable and make it more attractive so that more people can grow food like we do. We had major wins in Victoria last year uh, with the planning reforms. So we now, pastured pig and, uh, pigs and poultry are now recognized as low risk systems and uh, we are now regulated as such, which means it's an easier process for us to get our, our permit through a streamlined application. Um, they still want to charge us the same amount. We're working with the planning department to see if we can change the fees associated, but we haven't won that battle yet. Um, on, off the back of that, they introduced the artisanal agriculture program, and that's providing targeted grants to farms like ours to help build infrastructure on the farm or do collaborative distribution or whatever it is that is going to be of most assistance to farms to go forward and become the new normal, which is kind of the old normal. Um, the second thing that we're focusing on is around the infrastructure hurdles. So a very famous philosopher once said that those who control the means of production control the world. 
And we all know, and Eric is going to tell us, I'm sure, a lot about who those people are. Um, basically, the capitalists have been controlling the system for a long time, and our health is suffering for it, our land is suffering for it, um, our workers, everybody in the system is suffering because of who controls the means. So we have written into our constitution now that we are here to, uh, as an object, to support farmers in their efforts to control the means of production. We think that's one of the best things we've done. I was particularly very excited about that new object. <laughs> so whether it's abattoirs for small-scale livestock growers, whether it's grain mills for the growing uh, artisanal grain movement, um, dairy processing facilities for our poor suffering dairy farmers caught up in commodity systems uh, to help them scale down and you know basically grow less for more, which is our philosophy, um, or cold storage, shared cold storage, commercial kitchens, these are the blockages. Aside from the legislative barriers, it's the capacity to transform raw food into something for sale to eaters. And if we can take control of that back, we actually will change the system from the ground up. And that's what we're here to do. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Tammy. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, just quickly introduce you to Eva Peroni. Eva is a researcher, um, writer, and food systems activist. Um, you can find out more about her work and writing um, at evaperoni.com. So put your hands together for Eva Peroni. Thank you, everyone, for being here this evening. Thank you, Patrick, for the introduction and to Hepburn Relocalisation Network for hosting this event this evening. And thank you, Tammy, for letting us know everything that the Australian Food Sovereignty Alliance is up to. It's very important to keep on top of these things. Um, so I'm honoured to be introducing our panel this evening and to be able to engage in a deep and thoughtful discussion about how we can recultivate the social connections, the ecological understandings and the economic and community values to foster greater accountability to one another and to the earth and the land that we live on. For many people in Australia and across the globe, land is so much more than just property, soil or terrain. It's a living environment that sustains and is sustained by people and culture. The global struggle for land is part of people's daily struggle for life. For some, it's just another commodity. For others, it is their livelihoods, their values, their culture. It is a major factor underpinning most social and environmental justice activism, whether for genuinely affordable housing, food production, cultural preservation, community space, or enhancing vital ecosystems. Land can be an emotional and complex subject and many are often excluded from debates and decision making about how to reform an unjust system. I'm very excited to be hearing the unique and vital perspectives of our panel members this evening as to how we can build an inclusive movement for land and life where all voices are valued. It's my pleasure to welcome tonight Rebecca Phillips, a proud Pangarang and Jada woman. She believes the preservation and revival of her cultures is important to uphold what her ancestors paved the way for and what we must build on for future generations. Beck was an active and valued member on the Jar Jar Wurrung negotiation team negotiating a recognition settlement agreement with the state of Victoria and her people. She currently sits on the Delcunya Jal Land Management Board, setting the direction for the management of six parks and reserves to be jointly managed by the state, uh, the state government and Jar Jar Wurrung Clan's Aboriginal Corporation. Beck has been involved in the revival of her traditional language, Jar Jar Wurrung, through Jali Burujil, Jali Bunjil. Bunjil, language knowledge, and is reviving traditional and modern day songs and dances. It is also my pleasure to introduce David Holmgren this evening. 
As the permaculture co-originator, David is a leading thinker, writer and teacher on how societies and communities can become more resilient and have a lower impact on the environment. Together with his partner, Sue Dennett, David lives and works at Meliodora in Hepburn, one of Australia's best known permaculture demonstration sites. David has spent a lifetime developing a sustainable and fulfilling way of living. His latest book, Retro Suburbia, shows how Australian suburbs can be transformed to become productive and resilient in an energy descent future. And I extend a warm welcome to Eric Alt Jimenez, who has traveled all the way from California to be with us this evening. Eric is an agroecologist, political economist, lecturer and author. His first book, Campesino a Campesino, chronicles nearly 30 years work with peasant farmers across Central America and the political, socioeconomic and ecological factors that galvanized the farmer to farmer movement. As the current director of the Institute of Food and Development Policy, also known as Food First, Eric's work both informs and amplifies the voices and the social movements fighting for food justice and food sovereignty across the globe. In his latest book, A Foodie's Guide to Capitalism, Eric delves into the economic and political history and context of the current corporate food regime, exploring the commodification of food and land, as well as issues of power, privilege and exploitation across the food chain. To begin the conversation this evening, Rebecca, David and Eric will share their unique perspectives about how we can understand and relate to land through Indigenous culture and connection to country, permaculture and agroecology. Good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you. And thank you for the invitation to come here and speak. I, um, I haven't written any books and I'm just a cultural practitioner, another member of the Jara community, I'm a descendant of Caroline Malcolm, one of the apical ancestors recognized by the state as us having to prove our connection to this country that we have rights and obligations to care for. So I acknowledge my, my ancestors. We all do this. We do acknowledgement of country, acknowledgement of our ancestors. In this way, it's putting us on the right path for where we're at today, understanding where we're coming from, to know where we're going, and to acknowledge their hardships and the injustices, all of the struggles for them to just exist um, through the processes of colonization. Um, their endurance, adaptability, and their strength is the only reason I'm sitting here being able to voice Jara values and perspectives um, in this conversation today. So much love and respect to my ancestors and my family and my people and everyone else who is open and willing um, to hear our values and have them accepted as having a rightful place in this country. That has been one of the struggles we've had for, for so long, for over a, 10 generations. Um, I'd like to acknowledge this country too. When we say country, we're talking about we call it jandak. We have many different words for country, and so alterations of them when we are talking about our country for us, our country inclusive of everyone, um, and um, many, many other ways. But this beautiful country, you know, we have stories that articulate our ownership in a sense. It's not the ownership that we know of, um, this European concept or of a commodity or a property. It's more like our family. We, uh, we acknowledge everything as a, a living entity. 
that is connected to us in an unseen web. And all of our actions um, are determined by our obligations, our rights and our responsibilities to our country. And they've never stopped this whole time. Whether they've been acknowledged or um, a lot of them have been ceased, not by our choosing, but they've always been there, whether they've been in theoretical form or in practice. And today we're bringing a lot of those practices back now that um, it's accepted or it's we've our, because of the, the work our ancestors have done in stating our right to do these things. So I'm just somewhere along the journey, in a, a long journey for our people and uh, I hope to, um, to share something of value to you tonight. Um, I'm interested to see where the conversation goes with everyone here. Um, so I, w I would like to acknowledge this centerpiece that you said um, you spoke a little bit about. Sorry, I was a bit late. Um, and this, to me, is also like the mix I am. I am a Dada Warong and Pangarang woman on my mother's side, and on my father's side, I'm English, Macedonian, Australian. And so I feel like I've been very blessed to have an understanding of both views, how bad things could be, how great and normal things could be. Um, and I've been lucky to, um, to know of intergenerational traumas that have affected my people, but yet not having the full experience of them um, these things are not just only felt with us, they're within the land too, some of the horrible things that have happened. And we know this, we're all beings of energy and you know when you go to some places you get a really good feeling and you go to other places and not so good a feeling and you're wondering what's happened in this place to imprint in this memory here this energy that either needs healing or is actually inspiring you to do something there. Because uh, as you probably heard Uncle Bruce speaking last, we were farmers of the land and we were ceremonial people, we still are. We're working on the farming bit though. You need to have land to do that. And that's still an ongoing uh, challenge for us, although I'll probably talk a little bit about my role in the Del Cunyaja board a bit later. Um, I think it's good to be able to acknowledge where we're currently at and um, speak of how we got here without blame. But we need to acknowledge those things so that they don't occur in future and we have more of an understanding of why we are the way we are and what we're trying to achieve. So I am just me, Rebecca, Rebecca Phillips, with a uh, Jewish first name and a, a Macedonian English Australian last name. I'm quite a mixed bag, but I'm just me, so I can only speak for me. I do not speak for all Aboriginal people today. I do not speak for everyone in my tribe. I'm not a delegated elder. I am a messenger from my experiences and my learnings from my country, from some of my aunties, uncles, and from worldly people, other First Nations. Um, So I guess I can welcome you today from, from my people and generally my ancestors. This is one of the traditions that we've continued on. It means something different today than what it meant back before when we were the only people living here. Our customs and our traditions have changed as the land has. And even today, this is seen as a cultural service that we provide 
and there's monetary attachments to it. Sometimes that's confusing when it is a cultural duty and an obligation to do this. And now there's been a commercial price put on it. Um, and we have to actively engage in that system. But today I'm doing this just as a, as a thing that we would do gathering on someone's country. So, Bengek Womindika Benganano Jandaki Lani Dada Wurong Gundita Lani Maringa Kulinga Murpi. We welcome you to the home of the Jara people the home of our ancestral spirits. The other thing I wanted to do, it was inspired by this and by the way you've set up the circle, was I, I wanted to sing a, a meeting song because this is the way that our people would meet on land. We would sit in circles so we can all see each other and there's no lines where there's uh, someone at the front talking down to everyone sitting. All these um, subconscious things are putting that person in an authority figure, whereas when we're meeting like this, I can make a connection with every single one of you. So the words in that song, um, I think it's good to start with this song. It makes me feel less nervous after singing. Um, but also to hear the words born of this country as a good foundation for talking about it. And so our language has a completely different focus. And the more I'm learning it, the more I'm finding English to be quite backwards. Even, even though I have to uh, yeah, swap the grammar around because we actually say the most important thing in the sentence first. And we actually use a lot of wasteful words in English. Um, so, nyurnang warakang, those two words are for when we're meeting in a circle, around a campfire usually. Um, they mean just listening and talking, but delkup morupuk, delkup nyonila is a deep listening. It's when we connect um, not just with our ears or with our eyes, it's where we really hear each other. And um, I think that's kind of where we're going with this. So uh, thank you for the setup. Um, sitting around a fire is not only good for our health. Um, but when done the right way, we um, we get inspired. We're hearing the new life from dead wood uh, come about and speak to us. And fire is a, another tool that we used, and not only um, to shape the land, but there is a, a spiritual connection that happens there. So not only in my Delkunya Jar capacity, um, in my job I'm a Jandak 
we project officer, so I work in cultural burning and um, food and fibre planting. And so when before this I worked for a government organisation and I was a general firefighter for 11 years or 10 years and just the way of operating in that sense was so very, very different. Um, being told how to guard the fire, fire suppression and uh, burning in times that were not quite right and not worried about scorch and canopy fires. And I, I really feel like I've been jibbed. I would have loved to have learnt fire knowledge and wisdom from my people that they'd accumulated over thousands of generations. Those rules that would make us good with fire, you know, you'd be punished if that fire went up in the canopy. There was ways of, um, of burning right way. And so shifting from that way of doing it and now working for our um, Clans Aboriginal Corporation business arm in the Jandak team, completely shifted my uh, experience with fire, now being able to, uh, to light them without someone's guidance of where and how and with a drip torch and foreign smelly chemicals and, um, and watching the fire, moving with it, listening to where the fire wanted to go, having that country tell you whether it's ready to burn or not. Um, and so I guess when we're stuck in a, a programmed way of doing things, it's actually stifling our ability to connect in, in a particular way. We're told this is how it, how it does. Um, this is how it's supposed to burn. And even when it's not right to burn, we're going to put chemicals on it so it will burn. We're not listening to the land. And... Um, being out on country there with my mob, we had to get them out there without all these regulations. So we had to have particular training just to be able to stand on that site, which meant half of my mob couldn't come. So we had to go to private land to activate our right um, to care for country in this way. And seeing quite a few generations and the kids there, which are also not allowed under other regulations, but having kids with us means this fire is not a scary thing if you know how to use it and if you're taught all those lessons from a young person how to do it. Having the old aunties out there, and this was one of the most rewarding things for me on that day, was one of my aunties had said to me, as she didn't stop working the whole day, she wouldn't stop to go to the Jilwa, she wouldn't stop for a feed, she just was so into it and starved of this connection that she, she said, this is the stuff that adds years onto our life. This is a thing I think a lot of people are starved of. So the other project that we did um, was replanting Murnong. Um, out there, as Uncle Bruce is talking about, there was some miles and miles of these plantations and now, you know, to try and um, make a connection with that plant, we've got to go searching everywhere, even in our own land, um, in the land that we own, the six parks and reserves. That is no longer crown land. That is owned in Aboriginal title by Jada Wurrung Clans Aboriginal Corporation to be jointly managed with the state. So finally, we have some land. We have a say over. And so we want to replant it. We want to bring it back to um, quite, quite a productive and um, diverse state that it once was when my ancestors had left the benchmark of biodiversity. They had set that bar quite high and yes, where are we now? We've got songs and ceremonies we won't be singing because there's been so many um, extinctions since we were removed from sharing in the management of our country. So in order for us to get back out there and practice in this way, the harvesting of 
Murnong, we have to go out and plant it to bring it back into a healthy abundance for us to, to be those cultural people, to do those things that add years onto our life, to eat from our land, to have those foods that are grown here in our bodies, that connection with that flower, with that myrna. And so in order to do that, we wanted to do it by hand. The old ways, we did not want machinery coming in and ripping up the land or digging holes for us. So we needed to make our ghani again. Our ghani, our digging stick, this is a, a woman's survival. It means to live good. This is something we would carry with us everywhere. And some people might say, oh, that's quite primitive, it's just a stick. But um, a stick that can be used for many things is a valuable stick, found everywhere, um, and it's, you know, breaks down. It's not gonna, gonna, if it does break, I haven't seen them break though. Um, it's not gonna leave a mess. It doesn't have to go to a tip, it's not a landfill. This is the beautiful thing about the way we lived with our environment. Um, we were low impact because we used everything from it. Well, I guess we didn't have the option of, you know, importing plastics and metals and glass or things, but, um, you know, some cases when we're out in the river and you see all these fishing lines and things, rubbish in there, we want to clean that out so that it doesn't kill anything. And then we go, well, we really need to think about something more sustainable here. What if we got something that would break down easier? And then just had a silly moment where it went, it's already been created. Our ancestors used the fibers from the plants along the river that would break down, you know, or a bone hook. Oh, yeah, that's fine too. That's not going to kill anything in this way. So I think we've gone a little bit too far with technological advances. Um, and it's been pushed down our throat that this is something that we all needed. And there already was things that worked that didn't leave such a big impact. So having these interactions with our land, having all of the women out on country, out there planting our yams, talking and singing, we all know that plants benefit when you sing and when you talk to them. It's a completely different process and a beautiful connection and not only that, but out of that process came our, our Gani Murna song. So being out there and practicing these things is activating it inside of us again. All people have connection to place. We, we acknowledge this. We, um, we're all spirit beings and we can connect to our spirit world. Everything around us is a spirit world. And I guess our society has um, not acknowledged that or called us funny names for acknowledging it ourselves, that there is this other element out there and I think that's why when my ancestors looked after this land, it was in such good health. If we look at our own health, we don't only talk of it now, it is in physical terms. So we're not, we're not just physical bodies. We're, um, we talk about it in physical, mental, spiritual, well-being. And these are the things we need to consider with the land too. Just because it cannot talk in the sense that we talk, doesn't mean there isn't a, a mental and a spiritual health that we need to look after too. And this is where our ceremonies came in. This was our connection on that level with the things unseen. And so it's important for us to be able to continue those things. Only where can we do it these days? 86% of Jara country is privately owned. And when we had suggested in our joint management plans that perhaps we might like to zone off a section of the park, 
So we didn't have to share it with other visitors while we did a ceremony or be interrupted. We're not shutting people out of it. We just wanted it zoned off for, um, you know, a period of time when we wanted to do a ceremony for that particular season in that particular area. And we still get pushed back from this. We've still got a bit of a struggle in our uh, environmental, our land justice and our cultural rights and um, even our food. We really want, I've got aunties saying, uh, I need to go and eat this food, this will be good for my health. Well, since we've been excluded from our lands for so long, we no longer know actually where to find, where it's abundant enough to take. And we've asked this of the previous land managers who said, well, okay, you want to harvest things and you want to kill things? It's not just about that. It's about our connection with those things when we, when we are an active part of that ecosystem. And it's done out of respect. It's, it's definitely done in, with a very complex understanding of our interactions with it, our responsibilities to it, our kinships, and um, the effect all of our actions play in every part of the ecosystem. Our people were the first ecologists, hydrologists, geomorphologists, ge you know, all of them. It's just we didn't call them that. And so we think of it as something new. Absolutely not. Everybody had a role. Everybody knew the laws in which we interacted with our environment. And we knew them from when we were quite young. You hear of our dreaming stories and uh, things like this, and people go, oh, that sounds like a kid's story, you know, a fairy tale. And they were called this. They were called fairy tales or mythology. This is how you tell stories to children so they remember. Did anyone ever do this? I know I did in primary school where you all hold hands and you dance around everywhere, singing ring a ring a rosy, a pocket full of... Yeah, tissue, tissue, we all fall down. Right, so that's just something simple and a uh, little fun thing that we did as kids. But it wasn't until we were much older did we learn about the plague. Right, and that's the same way in which we told our stories. Once you were old enough to understand them, then you learnt it in great detail, but that story always stayed the same. No Chinese whispers, no embellishments. The stories stayed the same for thousands of years. We didn't need to write them down. And hidden in those stories and in our language is the wisdom of how we manage that, that land and what our um, relationship was with everything. Today, I'm not sure I can say that about the education system. I'm not sure uh, I even know all of the laws that operate around me locally, state, federal. We're not actually taught how to be competently living in this, in this world that's set up here. I struggle to know if I'm parking in the right spot sometimes. I can't even read those signs. I mean, like, is it this side or that side? But yet with our people, you, you would go through the law and that made you a competent, active community member, valued, who knew your place, you belonged. And, you know, we, we have suffered without this knowledge, without this, um, this way of being with our world that made us competent, confident, happy beings. And when we're happy and healthy, so is our land. We are a reflection of our land. So in that sense, we want to work harder on bringing back that intimate connection with our food and fibre and our animals. And we've still got a journey to go. And I'm very interested to hear what the others have to say in this regard. And um, 
hopefully we'll have some similarities and um, I guess we'll see where the conversation goes. I think I'm, have I been talking too long? No? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mm, when I was asked to uh, participate in another HRN event uh, at the town hall between a whole string of events we've been doing in relation to my new book, Retro Suburbia, I just said, yeah, sure, of course. Um, and... <laughs> uh, it was only a couple of days ago that I started to think about this and uh, look at it and I thought, that will be interesting, that will put me on the spot. Um, and I suppose so many of things that Rebecca raised uh, brought up things that, oh yes, I could talk about that from my personal experience of this place, of ancestry, of uh, permaculture ideas of how we reconnect a place as foreigners in a changed place at the same time that we rediscover our own roots hidden uh, behind so many uh, possibilities, so many things that are uh, echoes. I suppose also just uh, the issue of personal story and connection uh, to place. Uh, growing up in Western Australia on the edge of suburbia, uh, with the wild, the undeveloped wild around me uh, in the 1960s, a wild that we had no stories for, not from the adult world, and that it was largely a world that we explored as children and developed our own stories, our own nomenclature of place. Uh, we didn't have a written history, let alone an indigenous history. The tadpole swamps of Atterdale, the flooded uh, gum wetlands that were all turned into housing estates after the, the Swan River was infilled, the last place where the black swans were breeding on the Swan River that became a rubbish heap for the first 10 years of my life and then was the river was dredged and filled over and enough sand put into the wetlands to allow the developers to build houses a few inches above the peak winter flood zone. That loss of place was probably one of the places in my early emergent environmentalism um, that river, it's not really a river, it's a huge saltwater estuary, the Swan River. Melville Water is thousands and thousands of hectares. William Vlaming, the, the Dutch explorer, uh, coming up the river in his whale boat, described how they leaned out of the whale boat and grabbed a swan from the swans that covered the whole of Melville Water. Uh, as a kid, fishing on the summer nights with my father in the Swan River, we saw the abundance of kingfish and tailor, the, the dolphins and even the sharks that inhabited the river decline in number and diversity. I suppose those things were informative in an understanding of land that was not uh, through ownership. 
uh, but some form of inhabiting. So even growing up in what was arguably Australia, one of the most richest urbanised countries in the world, in fact, in 1900, per head of population, we were, along with Argentina, the richest country in the world and have been in the, that top percentage for most of the 20th century, the most urbanised, the most industrialised in the sense that we were settled by those thrown out from the first industrialised places on the planet, by people who had lost their cultural connection to land. Uh, my ancestors weren't those first convicts and soldiers who guarded them. Uh, some of my people on my father's side were Protestant English from Northern Ireland, supposedly direct descendant of Oliver Cromwell and therefore the prototype colonisers. Uh, my ancestors on my mother's side uh, were Jewish, Ashkenazi Jewish from Eastern Europe. Uh, and my Swedish grandfather, who ran away to sea at the age of 14. Things must have been pretty tough in Sweden to go on to the Iron Clippers as a 14-year-old. Part of the globalised trade of rapid movement of goods around the world in the late uh, 19th century. I, I suppose... Those things, no matter how much we dwell in new ideas like uh, permaculture has been a projection of modern ecological thinking in a context of disconnection from land. How do we reconnect to nature? How do we learn from indigenous and traditional cultures of place? and yet use the experience of modernity to forge some new culture which has to project into a future that we don't know what it is, but that we believe involves a reconnection to place, wherever that might be, accepting that that world has changed to some extent irrevocably, but that part of that journey is to find pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, of multiple jigsaw puzzles that might now be broken irrevocably that we have to gather together to carry forward and put together in some new jigsaw puzzle. Maybe reflected in of what nature is actually doing in front of us all the time. And a big theme in my work over all of the years of permaculture has been to learn from what nature does. Part of that learning is to understand co-evolved systems that have great antiquity and in the ecological lineage looking at um, uh, relatively intact, undamaged, least damaged or least changed ecosystems has been a great lineage in uh, the tradition of conservation biology. But from the beginnings of permaculture, we saw that these environments that have been damaged and degraded where nature has had some chance to recover through whatever mechanism are in some ways the most informative places because they tell us something about new emergent processes. And that is now, of course, a whole field of study which has a name called Novel Ecosystems. And Patrick's arrangement here is from the novel 
emergent ecosystems that are all around us very strongly in the places where the environment has been so radically changed. But for one reason or another, people, and more importantly, the economic process of extraction of resources has moved on, gone elsewhere. And this is one of the interesting stories that I've seen in my travels around, especially the affluent world, where today people live from the oil well rather than their immediate environment, that there's been this resurgence of wild nature, a recovery of forest, of even wildlife. Not necessarily the things that might have been there before or all of the things that were there before. And whether this is in Japan, in the United States, in Europe, in Australia, New Zealand, that experience is actually really common. And there's no more in place where that is so intense as central Victoria because the impact of the gold era that led to massive transformation in our landscapes that when I came here in the mid-80s with my experience of being able to read what we call reading landscape, of being able to see from what you can see in front of you what was here yesterday, 10 years ago, 100 years ago, and hopefully see the echoes of what was here thousands of years ago. That that I've been teaching is the core skill in any sort of evolved permaculture design. Rather than just bringing what we know and what we want to impose, genuinely trying to understand place, both from connection to other sources of knowledge, but also directly by experience of observing, of seeing those things. Um, so that, to some extent, we all have that ability to be able to read landscape in the same way that we have ability to read people, read their body language, but we can also get better at it. So that process of how we actively build connection to the natural abundances of nature, not necessarily guided by past law, but observing what is their surplus, what does appear to be almost explosive, almost the things that are that are seen as plagues or pests? And can we harvest some of that to provide for our material needs rather than projecting out what we want to nature to produce? And so we do this in the garden at this time of the year uh, when the diversity of planted vegetables is low. There's a higher proportion of what people call weeds in our diet, the abundances, that if we can stop thinking of forms of life as plagues, as biological pollution, but abundances, we can at least in a tentative reconnection be more certain when we take some of what as much as we can see is abundant. And when we do that for ourselves, in the household and community non-monetary economy, without the bank backing of high technology, uh, legal systems of support and subsidy and bank finance, when we do that at that household scale, we can be more certain of it because we can see the feedbacks, the consequences of what we do. If we make a mistake, if we do something that's inappropriate, it's smaller scale. The next scale up is when we work in the local monetary economy, doing something uh, where people are responsible for the business 
activity. And if we withdraw as much as possible out of the corporate uh, controlled economies driven by globalised finance and uh, rarefied technologies as much as is practicable, then we minimise that uh, not just chance of unknown adverse consequences, but also of accelerating the wealth and power pump that sucks everything into those centres of power. Now, whether that is a significant act to in any way uh, unseat those systems is secondary to it being a functional reconnection to where we are and a dealing with the consequences of our own uh, actions. So that's how I suppose I see a connection between the sense of country, uh, the awareness of the larger forces that have put us where we are, and the possibilities for uh, somewhere better and some sort of practical pathway that we have to find. Uh, and I suppose permaculture has been my way of trying to explore and convey that. Of course, permaculture is now a global movement which is its own organic unfolding, completely out of control. And uh, out of control, in some ways, is a good thing. <laughs> uh, out of control, um, that might contribute to how we can reconnect to place. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm privileged and honored and amazed to be here. If you had told me uh, just a few years ago that I would be running around rural Australia talking about capitalism and, and farming, I'd have thought you were nuts. And yet here we are. And that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, thank you so much for this invitation and, and for all the work that's gone into bringing me here from California. Um, Um, those are the, that's the language of my ancestors and my grandfather. We're Basque and we are the indigenous people of the Iberian Peninsula um, and have never given up our land, uh, even though we have been driven from, driven from it by the millions and um, have become colonizers around the world. We're famous for our boat building. We're famous for our sheep. Um, both central elements to colonization um, of the West, of the rest of the world. Um, but I say that, use that language out of respect for the indigenous people of this land. Thank you for, what I said was thank you for um, welcoming, welcoming me onto your land. Um, and I also want to thank everybody here for this invitation. To, to complement what's been said is not going to be an easy thing because uh, there are so many elements um, which have just been expressed. But I think that um, one thing we all have in common is that we're here largely because of what's called the agrarian transition. The reason we're having this dialogue, this 
conversation is because of the agrarian transition. And the agrarian transition has already been uh, described by David. It, it is, was when the, the commons was enclosed in Europe. The peasantry was driven off the land by many different, many peasants were driven off the land, not all, by many different means, um, both through the market and by the enclosures and, and, and by large landowners and paramilitaries. And, and it was a violent process by which um, the peasantry was driven off the land and at the same time had to subsidize the development of industry and the Industrial Revolution with cheap labor and cheap food, without which the Industrial Revolution um, might never have happened. I mean, we talk about the steam engine and we talk about capitalism, but had it not been for the um, coerced and cheap labor of the peasantry and the cheap food that the peasantry produced, um, industrial revolution would never have gotten off the ground. And then, of course, what to do with all these peasants once you've displaced them from their land while well, we went um, into the prisons and then came to the United to what is now the United States and came to what is now Australia. Um, that process of uh, agrarian transition also has what's called within it uh, the agrarian question, which is what is the role of the peasantry and the small farmer in the class wars which developed as a result as the development of capitalism. And I think that those things are still being fought out today, 300 years later. We're still facing the agrarian question. We're still facing agrarian transitions. And they're no less important and no less historic than they were 300 years ago, and no less um, crucial for the future of civilizations on this planet. So the Romans, the first um, imperialist par excellence, one of the first things they did, of course, was to categorize land. And there was uh, private land, and public land. Um, there was common land, which they realized they had to leave uh, their subjects, some common land, and then um, there was basically open access land. And that open access land um, is the land of colonialists. It's the frontier which is in dispute. It's that land which supposedly belongs to no one, which really means the land which is fair game for colonizing. And in, able, in order to be able to do that, um, what the Romans had to do, and then what the English had to do, and what the Spanish had to do, was to invisibilize the people who were already on that land. Um, and while it's popular to say, well, you know, we didn't understand their management systems, I think that's bullshit. Um, you didn't want to understand those ways of being. They were irrelevant to the imperialist project, and so they had to be invisibilized and then eliminated. Um, and so the agrarian question then is, is, is part of a very violent expansion of capitalism from Europe to what the capitalists called the New World, which was in fact a much, much older world um, than from where capitalism originally came. So I think that um, with that agrarian transition, we have these very important um, systems of, um, we call them systems of tenure, but in fact they are a relation. The commons is a relation, private property is a relation, um, public property is a relation governed by very specific sets of rules, just as what we're calling open access, which was in fact indigenous land, is a relation. And, um, but it's a relation which is not governed by private property and it's not governed by commodities. So what is produced there does not become a commodity. And I think it's very important to be very clear on what a commodity is. 
Um, because just, just because we have a commons doesn't mean we don't produce commodities. We like to think about the commons, and it's true that the commons are those things that we share in common, we decide about in common, outside of the market. Mm. We make the decisions. It's not the market making the decisions for us. As a community, within the commons, we make the decisions. And so it's, it's similar in many ways to the way many indigenous peoples lived on their land and sat in circles and decided about what was going to be done and how tradition was going to be interpreted and applied um, throughout, through the seasons. But the fact that a commodity is produced for sale in the market, it's not just a good. Goods can be traded, goods can be sold, but a commodity embodies alienated labor. And what I mean by that is that to produce a commodity, um, labor has gone into the commodity, but whomever put that labor in the commodity is alienated from the value of that labor. That stays with the capitalist, and that's what makes it a commodity. Mm. So the people who, did, who put in the labor don't necessarily realize the value. So that's alienated labor. That's what makes a commodity. So sometimes we're afraid about, oh, can we have a, a system in which we buy and sell things? Of course we can. They don't have to be commodities. Mm. We can value the labor in different ways. So, the, as capitalism has progressed, it's gone through, it's used primarily these forms of, of tenure um, to uh, manage and mediate the expansion of capital. That's what it's about. And, and it would be useless if there wasn't private property. <laughs> if you can't, and so private property of the land is the very first condition for capitalism. So it's very um, easy to think that, well, if we just abolish the private property, then we're going to destroy capitalism. And certainly it is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. So it's really important to think about tenure. It's really important to think about land. But it's also extremely important to think about the relation that we're talking about and the types of relations that we need now to protect ourselves from the ongoing and upcoming agrarian transition, which is going to make the historical transition seem like a, a picnic, um, and to heal ourselves and regenerate the natural functions of the land which we inhabit. As capitalism has expanded around the globe, it usually starts with agriculture. First there's the extraction of the trees, the extraction of the minerals, and then colonists, settlers, come in and have to feed themselves and feed the crown or, or feed <laughs> the government which is pushing them in. Um, and so farmers create a surplus, and that surplus is appropriated. And that surplus is appropriated, and it's used for armies and for continued expansion and for capital investment and for industrialization and automation and all those other things. The point being that it would be impossible if it wasn't for that primary production, if it wasn't for the um, appropriation of that primary production, if it wasn't for the extraction of wealth in the form of minerals, in the form of soil, in the form of um, biological forms like trees and whatnot. So as capital expands, there's a logic of territory. I uh, was working in Guatemala, and it was very clear that the World Bank came in, and suddenly there were all these projects in the highlands, in the indigenous communities, for um, Ecosystem services. Like the, the indigenous people could, could plant trees and get carbon credits and provide ecosystem services for which they would be paid. And there, was, there were huge impact studies and environmental studies done in the highlands about where is the wealth 
and, and how should we develop this wealth and how can we distribute this wealth? And they talked about the ecosystem services and how much the forest was worth and how much the reforestation was going to be worth and the, the new management plan for the highlands. And funny enough, they didn't talk about the gold that they were really after. Do you see, there's a logic of capital. The logic was how do we extract this gold and how do we rearrange the highlands within that logic? How do we get the indigenous populations to accept that they're going to have to plant trees over here and we're going to extract the gold here? And this water, that's actually going to go for the gold. And this open pit mining and the effluent, that's actually going to go into the river. And this all came about because the price of gold went up. And so the World Bank came in and, and first um, decided they were going to modernize the environmental ministry. And then they were going to modernize um, the Ministry of Mines. And then they were going to modernize uh, transportation. And all of this followed a logic of the rearrangement of the territory with different sets of roads, with a different use of the landscape, with a different use of the people, all just to get at the gold. So this is called territorial restructuring. And it follows a logic of capital and it situates itself within a territory. And I say this because so much of the pushback against capitalist agriculture and industrial agriculture and modernity and whatnot has been sort of on a case-by-case -case basis. So, you know, we need renewable energy. Or, you know, we need, we need organic food. And we're going to advance uh, organic farming or permaculture or agroecology, whatever it might be. And so we have this sort of sectoral focus and we're dealing with real problems. It's not, we're, we're solving the problems of malnourishment um, and now with all the processed food, the problems of, of diet-related disease, and we're solving the problems of, of increasing greenhouse gases. We're really dealing directly with these pressing, pressing issues for humanity, which we have to deal with. But we almost never do this within the logic of territory. Capital has a logic for territory. They identify the territory, they know what they want out of that, whether it's sheep or whether it's gold or whether it's trees, whether it's lumber. And then we will restructure that entire territory in order to get at that and extract the wealth and accumulate it somewhere else and leave us with all of the externalities, with the polluted rivers and the polluted bodies. So if we're going to roll back industrial agriculture, if we're going to advance alternatives to the logic of capital, which is pushing us right off the edge, and now it's, it's I mean, no one can, can deny global warming anymore. Even Donald Trump can't deny global warming. The other day he said, yeah, 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 global warming is, is a thing. You know, the, the climate is changing, but it'll change back. So those levels of stupidity are only possible if you have power to say these incredibly stupid things. You have to be either very, very rich or very, very dumb. Um, and in this case, it's both, but that's just a particular individual case. So, um, I think that the challenge that we're facing, and I say this because um, I'm very privileged to work at Food First. We've been around for over 40 years. We, our mission is to end the injustices that cause hunger and environmental destruction. And we've, we've been forming alliances with people on the ground around the world um, to push back against the injustices that cause hunger and destroy the environment. Um, 
And as we see these spontaneous expressions of resistance around the world, that the resurgence of indigenous wisdom within the climate justice movement, um, within agroecology, um, I'm seeing it here as we, as we speak. I've, I've been seeing it every single um, uh, meeting that I've gone to. There has been a recognition of whose land we are on. And I know that's not enough, but you know it's a start. And um, all this pushing back, all this attempting, we call it prefigurative politics, all this attempting to carve out a new way of doing things, carve out a new way of relating with each other and with the land, which is not determined by the commodity function, which is not determined by the market. People are doing this all over the world. And they're drawing from, um, they're drawing from uh, experiences like the commons, they're drawing from experiences from um, indigenous communities, and they're inventing a lot of new things. But the point is, we're deprivatizing and decommoditizing our lives, attempting to build community um, in harmony with the land. And the problem is that, well, the strength in that is its incredible diversity. The resilience in that is its diversity. Um, and the problem is the diversity. So we're, we're incredibly fragmented. It's not like the 1930s where we had strong labor movements and strong communist parties and all these and overthrow capitalism. That's gone. That did what it could do and went as far as it could go. And there was plenty of, of, of very sort of twisted deviations as well and entrenched orthodoxy which killed those movements. So the new social movements which include the wisdom of ancient peoples um, are challenged in ways which we were never challenged before in the fight against capital. So we're challenged to converge in all of this diversity. We don't know how to do this. We've never done this before. And yet there is no other way, as far as I can see. Um, if we need to find the, the pathways to this convergence, it's not just political convergence, it's a very deep convergence. <clears throat> we also need to be quite clear about the politics of this because capitalism is quite clear about the politics of this. And so we have to be clear about the politics. It, it, it's not really an option to absent oneself from the politics because the politics will never be absent. Um, so we need to repoliticize our work, politicize our gardens, politicize our CSAs, um, and all the other alternatives which we are developing um, so as we speak using, I would say, also a tremendous diversity of small utopias, which we follow. I don't know if you've heard of the um, writer Eduardo Galeano, who's an Uruguayan writer who um, talks about utopias and how important they are. So not because of, of that we'll, we will ever reach them. And in Spanish, utopia is, is feminine. And so he says, the utopia, utopia is so important. She says, he says, because I take a step towards her, she takes a step back. So I take another step and she recedes. So utopias are basically there to guide us. And so the question is, can we bring our different visions and our different utopias together in a way which brings us together powerfully, deeply, in order to create the political will, the social force to create the political will within our systems to make the changes that we need to make. Political will responds to two things and two things only, money <laughs> or power, social power. So if we can build enough social power and embarrass enough politicians, we can begin to 
introduce reforms which provide us with a little more space where we can converge a little more deeply and become a little more powerful, develop our, our methodologies and our practices a little bit more to then be able to push for more reforms and transformative reforms. The system has to transform completely. We can't possibly transform our food system without transforming capitalism into something else. It's, it's impossible. The food system has co-evolved with capitalism. You can't change one without changing the other. And yet it seems so big and so large to say, oh, we're just going to overthrow capitalism. But in fact, it's got to go. Hmm? Now it can go in increments, or it can go violently in, you know, in one big fell swoop, and we don't exactly have control over that. Capital has its own contradictions, its own crashes, its own crises, which we don't have that much control over. Um, so I think that it's very important for us to think about territorial restructuring in ways which are equitable, regenerative, and quite frankly, spiritually. Grounded in love, rather than grounded in money. So, I feel like there are our European traditions in, in this fire circle, this, this problematic circle that we find ourselves in. Um, we have different traditions, different knowledges, different ways of knowing which are coming together. And that we have to defend and make space for respect and learn from, which is, I think, what we're trying to do. So we're on the right path. Um, and I think that particularly the, the vision of Native peoples allows us to begin to think about land as territory, land as where we live. Not land necessarily as what we manage, but land as something that we belong to. It's a very different way of thinking about producing, reproducing, consuming, sharing, being a part of um, the landscape. There are obstacles to this project. And the, we drag these obstacles along from history. So clearly there's obstacles of classism. And I say classism because even though we consider ourselves to be a classist, um, uh, a classless society in the United States, as you do here, I think, in Australia, uh, we're wrong. We're not. We're in, a class, we're in a class society because it's capitalism and it works on the basis of classes. Basically owning classes and everybody else. So we have to overcome, overcome classism. We have to overcome sexism because in fact capitalism is a patriarchal system. Patriarchy precedes capital but it really flowers with capitalism. And we have to face the um, barriers of racism, which also flowers under capitalism. So that means that we have to face racism, classism, and sexism, not only in our society, but in our own organizations, in our own households, and within ourselves. And this is a different project from the oppressor, from the oppressed, but both Engage, must engage in different ways. And from the, as a, speaking as a white male, I have to come to terms with white patriarchy and with the guilt that I feel, but that's my job. That's none of your, the women's job. That's none of the indigenous people's job. No, that's my job. I've got to deal with that trauma because I can't possibly dismantle patriarchy if I'm feeling guilty. Guilty is what weakens us. So what I'm saying is that we all have work to do, internal work to do, spiritual work, work of the heart, which we need to do, because if we don't do it, then we can't come together. And if we can't come together, if we can't converge, 
then we can't create the political power that we need in order to change the rules, the institutions, the structures which are destroying our societies and destroying our land. So that is the work. It's not extra work. It's not something we do after we get, get power. <laughs> we won't be able to get power unless we do the work. So what we need is an agroecology um, to dismantle racism, a permaculture to dismantle sexism. Um, A, a regional management to dismantle classism. We need all those things. Um, and I guess I, the last thing I, I want to say is that these things are happening now um, and overcoming these barriers to convergence are happening. There are strategic alliances being built. For example, Via Campesina, which is a uh, International Peasant Federation with 200 million members um, has formed an alliance with the World, March, uh, the World March of Women. Why? Because most of the farmers in the world are women. And so Via Campesina has decided, well, we can't have food sovereignty without the women. So they've taken a position as we cannot have food sovereignty without an end to all violence against women. And the World March of Women has decided, you know, we can't overthrow patriarchy unless we control the food system. So food sovereignty is part of the plank of the platform of women's liberation. Do you see? These are the deep strategic alliances we need to build, but can only build on the basis of trust, which means you have to work through this shit. Actually, this sounds huge, it sounds like this is impossible, it's like, when's that going to happen? Can we do it before the planet completely burns up? Well, we don't know. We do know what's going to happen if we don't do anything. But in some ways, history is on our side, at least the history of capitalism, in, in a very ironic way is on our side because capitalism always goes through two periods. It goes through a period of liberalization and it goes through a period of reform. And liberalization is when they take the gloves off the market and they privatize everything and there are no regulations and capital does whatever it wants, extracts whatever it wants, pollutes whatever it wants, pays whatever wages they want. But if capital was con to continue like that indefinitely, it would destroy society and destroy the environment and destroy the basis for the accumulation of capital. So what always happens is that pretty soon people get sick and tired of this and can't take it anymore. There's a big financial crash or something, which are cyclical anyway with capitalism, and then people fight back. So you think about the crash of, the 19, of 1929, stock market crash, the entire world goes into oppression, people take to the streets, the uh, political organizations, the labor organizations are strong, and they force reforms onto the governments. The New Deal, Starts with agriculture, in the United States, starts with agriculture and with food. Germany, Italy, Spain also introduce reforms. They're fascist reforms to stabilize the system. So there's a political choice there. We've had the big crashes, right? We had the big real estate crash, then we had the, the crash in 2011. We're about to have another crash in any year, any, any moment now. So we've had those crashes. There have been big threats before the threat was communism and socialism. Now the threat is global warming. What's keeping us from introducing the reforms is that we have not built the counter movement. We're not strong enough yet to force those reforms. But the rest of the structural issues have happened and are already happening. So in that way, history is sort of marching ahead of us. So the question really is, can we come together in different ways of knowing, of living on our land, in our territories? Can we contradict the logic of capital with the logic of humanity and diversity? And can we do it in time? So I guess what I'm saying is keep doing whatever it is you're doing. If you're doing 
permaculture, if you're farming, if you've got a CSA, if you're in working with the government to figure out about how are we going to manage this territory in accordance with our ancestral values, keep doing that. Don't stop. That's absolutely essential. But on top of that, <laughs> we have to come together. On top of that, we have to politicize in order to dismantle the, polit the political structures of capital. There never was a better time. Thank you. So how do we decapitalize our system when we keep sending our children to the basis of capitalism, which is to schools, which are the base level of where we start all this? Are we going to reform it? Or are we going to chuck it out the window because it's the basis of the whole thing? I think someone else might be uh, better to answer this one as I don't have any children yet. Although I have thought about that myself and I, I thought about homeschooling. Yeah, at least that way I know our history would be taught a little different and the values that we hold would be priority in uh, understanding um, how to conduct yourself in the world, your relationships with things. Um, I hadn't written up a school curriculum yet, but uh, I definitely thought about homeschooling. Well, I, I think we have to take sort of a, um, a guerrilla approach, um, which is um, to say, yes, I think we do need to take our children out of the system, at least from time to time. I've done that. I've had my kids out for a year, had them out for a few months, and we're not, and then, um, you know, they've gone back into, into the public school system with a, with a different perspective. I've also um, worked within the public school system um, with a school gardens, approach, for example, in which a lot of stuff happens in those gardens, as you all know, um, in order to, to contradict the, the program of socialization, which is in our schools. And, um, you know, I mean, I've read Deschooling Society, like so many of us have. So I, I think we need a flexible approach. And, um, you know, those who can raise their children outside and homeschool them, I think, should. But I also see that there's value of having participated in the public school system and knowing how to, neg to navigate that. I mean, because the point is to transform the damn thing. It's, it's, and so one kind of has to have some sort of interaction and certainly um, understand what all the other children are learning and why they may be as confused as they are or as um, violent as they are. So I, th I think that you're absolutely right about the taking education back um, from the capitalist uh, school system. But what that means is both, it's both a, a structural and institutional challenge, but it's also, quite frankly, just an intellectual and emotional and, and social challenge. So we, we might be within the institution, but that doesn't let us off the hook in terms of the um, intellectual and social education which we need to um, in inculcate in our children in order for us to change the system. Um, hearing what you've had to say, reflecting myself, um, that I found my schooling to be quite hard to, and it was very indoctrinating and, um, and culturally isolating too nothing taught about me or my people um, except that we died from the common colds and we didn't exist anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that, that was hard for me um, in primary school and because there was no education about um, our people or our culture, my brother was beaten up nearly every single day until my uncle and my mum had come down and done a cultural awareness um, for all the kids and then they were really interested in wanting to know more and we didn't get picked on anymore. Same thing in high school. 
Although I understand what you mean. In, in my high school, um, you were only deemed a good student if you did well in English, maths and science. And I, I was good at, with my hands. I did woodwork, welding, arts, cooking. And none of those things were valued by my, by my school. And so um, I guess in, in looking for a quick solution, I was thinking rather than take on the beast that is the curriculum set by who, looking at the way our old people had done this, um, it's one of the most important roles uh, getting our future, our future generations, our next leaders, ready to take on the world after we leave it, and this system that's imposed on us is doesn't value that, um, doesn't value the role of the people who are doing this, who we send off our most precious things, our kids, to um, to be looked after and to be reared up while we're off you know, participating in the economy. Like, our way, we, you would never send your children off to strangers. It was always raised by your aunties and your family. And that way you were reaffirmed your place and your, your belonging, and you were loved that whole time. You were nurtured and strengthened, and they were patient with you because that blood and that love bond was there. So you can see those weaknesses that you need to help work with and you can really build on those strengths you, you can identify in those kids. And that's perhaps what we need to move more towards, having more community participation in, in our schooling system. Um, my dad was, was very keen on that too, the Macedonian side, very family orientated, and he wanted to volunteer his time because, you know, in schools where there's 20 kids to one teacher and they're not getting that, um, they're not getting the attention that they need and they deserve. Even just having another adult in there to keep on track or to ask a question and, um, you know, these, these are the kinds of small wins we can input into the system and I, I agree having been in that system has made me a much smarter and wiser person it's always good to know your enemy or frenemy or <laughs> whatever you want to call it but uh, I wouldn't be half as successful as I have, have been without um, having to learn some things the hard way yeah. What is the difference between a capitalist and an entrepreneur? Isn't it that an entrepreneur needs to be a capitalist and a capitalist is an entrepreneur? <laughs> There's a lot of talk about entrepreneurs now because um, I think that's a, a um, ideological device to individualize us. So uh, social problems uh, are supposed to be addressed through entrepreneurialism to the extent that we have what's called the entrepreneurialism of the self. And so people put up you know, their own websites and sell themselves as a commodity in order to negotiate the capitalist system. Um, and I think that there's been a fetish made out of entrepreneurialism in this period of late capitalism, this period of neoliberalism when everything is privatized and we're so fragmented from one another. And so we, we, we're seduced into believing that, um, you know, we can invent the new app and, you know, to solve global warming and, and everything will be fine. I think it's a myth. And I think what we really are after is just human innovation and innovations which can't necessarily be commodified innovations that uh, we you know social and cultural and 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 technical innovations that we need in order to solve our problems 
um, as a society. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I worked for about 30 years with a peasant movement in Central America, it was basically indigenous and peasant movement, and for agroecology. So they were um, rejecting the fertilizers and the pesticides, which were destroying their land and ruining their family economies, and basically engaging in regenerative agriculture, rebuilding their soils, conserving soil and water and whatnot. And there was a bean which someone discovered on the eastern coast of Honduras, uh, and they call it is a velvet bean. And it, they found that it produced 30 tons of biomass per hectare. You could grow it in with the, with the maize. And it would smother all the weeds, so you didn't have to weed. And you did have to pull it down off the maize stalks a little bit because it was a very aggressive bean. But, it, I mean, it would grow up this deep. And then at the end of the year, it would all dry off. And this is the tropics. So very quickly, um, those uh, leaves would decompose. And people were building up soil at the rate of half an inch a year with the help of that bean. And it traveled farmer to farmer across Central America in, in the space of about five years with no money, no help from agriculture extension, and no help from the ministries of agriculture, very little help from the philanthropies. Um, but it was an incredible innovation because farmers adapted it in so many different ways. There was, you know, 20 different ways to grow this bean depending on what your objective was. Um, and so I think about that social, that those types of how we can um, encourage innovation amongst us and then encourage the sharing. The, the movement that I worked with said that it, uh, it walked on two legs, innovation and solidarity and that it worked with two hands, production and protection of the environment. And it went on to talk about its eyes and its voice and its heart. Um, that it, that the movement fleshed itself out, um, but innovation was one of the pillars of the movement because people had to figure out how to regenerate their soils and stop it, this, the land from washing down the hill and you know, you couldn't afford a surveyor, so they invented this little A-frame that, that laid out contour lines so they could establish their terraces in a way that stood up to the worst hurricane in the history of Central America, Hurricane Mitch. And those terraces held. And um, so, just to say, we need to create the, um, the environment, the social environment, for continual innovation in agriculture. There's no such thing as just static, traditional agriculture. It's always changing. People are always inventing. People are always innovating. Um, and that's exactly what we need, particularly today with, with global warming and, and the paroxysm, paroxysms of uh, capitalism. So whenever someone says entrepreneur, I sort of yawn. And um, I think the point is really innovation. Uh, I was just wondering <clears throat> uh, what, what your vision of a, uh, a post-capitalist society looks like, sort of uh, from a point of view of politics and our institutions. I suppose in, um, I mean, I would have thought Eric could uh, answer that, but uh, uh, I think we're all uh, finding that pathway. Um, and I think from my perspective, it's been partly how we walk, crawl before we walk, before we run. So to model the massive changes that are needed require rediscovery as well as innovation, experimentation. And my approach has always been to do that 
firstly at the level of the self, to try and see how we are connected and dependent on, in permaculture, I've spoken of seven domains of action, land and nature stewardship being the first and foremost, buildings and technology, education and culture, health and spiritual well-being, economics and finance, uh, land tenure and community governance. And, you know, that expansion of, oh, is permaculture really about all of those things? That sort of overwhelming sort of agenda of theory of everything. But if we sense that we are connected and dependent and in some ways on each of those domains, then we can at least start to restructure our personal relationship to all of those, even if there's one which is a strong starting point or is one which is our role in society, that we are refiguring our relationship to all of those and then doing that in our households and families, in our livelihoods and our communities and have a sense that that is a learning cycle that spirals out without necessarily having a grand plan of exactly what that might look like as a whole system at some larger global scale. So I think that is necessary in any way. That's how natural evolutionary processes work. They model something and then uh, scale up and one of the um, I suppose axioms of systems theory is that complex systems that work evolve from simple systems that work. Complex systems that are like designed from scratch almost never work and they're certainly not modelled on how nature does things. So that's been to sort of, so I mean you could simplify that as saying um, you know, thinking globally, acting locally, that slogan, that's one perhaps more sophisticated interpretation of it. How do you actually model the things we're talking about at a small scale? And that also tests for stuff-ups, <laughs> mistakes of ideology and whatever, because it's mistakes at a smaller scale. It also allows other people to see something that they can be empowered by, that they actually have the power to, oh, I can copy that or replicate that or apply that or try that in a different context. So uh, that's, I suppose, uh, the way we've chosen to work uh, in that way from, uh, yeah, the bottom up without knowing what that looks like at a larger scale. I'm going to have a stab at it too. Um, I, I liked the the comment that, you know, agric agriculture has been kind of in the lead of, of the capitalist problems being created, which to me also is can be the leading back out. And the ever-growing movement of community-supported agriculture is one example of solidarity economies that are non-capitalist. The... Um, the problem we have in, like in the, our movements is that systems like ours, where we're doing as much as we can to uh, take ourselves out of those commodity systems, out of the capitalist systems, by controlling the entire system ourselves with a community uh, of, the, of the eaters who buy our food, but also the people who we get waste stream feed to feed to our animals, um, and we you know, metabolize industrial food systems waste. We still have, for us in our farm, we still have the abattoir uh, problem. So we're still connected. We have an umbilical to the commodity system via abattoirs. And we want to sever that by building a community abattoir here that will be cooperative and not for profit. So for the, um, the grains movement are the same thing, you know, with the artisanal grains growers wanting to sell to the bakers and they need mills to help them do that, that they want to control themselves. You know, in Cambodia, it's rice mills. They're, they're tied to the industrial rice mills until they kick them out. So they need to be building rice mills. But I think that food is so central and tangible um, and, and, you know, well, every day, needed every day. And it's something that 
if we can show ways of having stronger solidarity economies and bartering activities because it's a, something we can produce and exchange with each other that is totally outside of the capitalist model and then start applying that to lots of the other, you know, like the idea of the new materialism um, so where, we, where we value the material good, where the maker of something is not alienated from their labor. They exchange it directly with a human instead of into a commodity market where they don't know whether that material good gets uh, appreciated or not. And it, of course, it doesn't get appreciated because it's being produced at a scale that loses its meaningfulness anyway. So that's my thing. Thank you. Can I tack on? So, so I, I think that, um, yeah, we're not sure if it's going to be a, a, a singular uh, post-capitalist society or many different types of societies. Hopefully there's a, a plurality of societies. Um, but I think that one thing that we'll have to have in common is um, we'll have to decommodify uh, land, labor, and capital, um, which are not really commodities at all. A commodity is something which you make. You don't make land. <laughs> you don't make labor. We procreate. Um, and you don't make capital, you know. So um, the, starting there, I think those are sort of the basic rules um, which would then, those, keeping those as commodity is a barrier to, to discovering the post-capitalist society. So those are the, the main uh, things that we have to decommodify are those false commodities. I'm um, interested in your thoughts on, this is very related to the last question, um, on what a transformed economy would look like, um, a transformed economic life, because I think what's really come through has been that, um, tonight has been that the economic system which is embedded in our culture is driving a lot of the dysfunction and a lot of the destruction and a lot of the alienation and we need to do it differently um, and I, there's a quote Margaret, Margaret Thatcher actually said once um, about free market society um, there's no alternative we have to do it now clearly that's wrong um, there clearly is an alternative but I think we're still kind of grasping and feeling our way to what it is um, and a, suggest a couple of suggestions that I have um, and interested in your thoughts on this and other, other basics for it are um, the, an economy that is based around cooperation primarily rather than competition um, and also one that is based around where the participants have a sense of um, valuing and respect f um, f for the whole and for each part of the whole. So this is where perhaps an indigenous, um, that indigenous kind of awareness is particularly valuable in that, that reverence for life, reverence for all forms of life and all, all aspects. Um, so that each decision that's made within that economy is based not just based around what's in it for me, but what, how will this affect the whole, how will this affect um, the person sitting next to me, the plants there, the river there, and so on. So um, just handing, handing that over and interested to hear um, what other elements a different way of doing economy might have. That's a really good question. Um, and I was having an urge to read this out anyway, and so you've just given me a good segue. Um, because we were so effective as a community because of our roles um, looking after each other and particular parts of the environment. Um, being responsible for them also gave you a, a right and a value and a place and I think that's part of the issue today so many people don't feel they have a belonging they don't have a place they're lost and then they're unwell and um, without that kind of structure 
that values everybody. Everybody can do something to help out. And sometimes this is, this, it just doesn't feel like people know what to do. What can I do? Um, and so I, I actually wrote this a little while ago and it's been in my head. I think it's about the drivers. Um, what's shaped our connection with our country and our use of it. Different before the time of gold um, and currency. Um, although we've had the ability to exploit our environment as early migrants and modern society has, we had a different drivers shaping our relationship with country and influence over it that meant with this power comes great responsibility to all things and to our future generations. We know that Einstein had said that every action has an equal or opposite reaction. And we have heard of the butterfly effect. We know of upstream, downstream effect, and yet there are still actions carried out on our country that have no consideration of the cause and effect impl implications on the future generations. Bunjil's law states that we only take what we need from our country, and if we must take more, we must give something in return. So it's not just about negotiating or trading with humans, it's trading with the land as well. Even when I do a smoking ceremony yesterday, and I go and took some leaves from our particular medicine trees, I give back that tree some water and thank it for growing those leaves for um, me to be able to pick them and share in that ceremony. I talked to that tree, my sister Polich. I thank her for helping me in cleansing um, with that ceremony. In a time where there was no currency of coin, the natural resources provided by Earth Mother and Sky Creator was our trade. Caring for country was our economy, and we invested in it for our survival and for the survival of future generations. Abundant and diverse resources with the knowledge of how to utilize and manage it with the laws of sustainability, that was our inheritance, our Jua Majandak, to care for and to share. The way we traded emphasised equality amongst people where country could not be owned as we understand the European term of ownership. We belong to our country and it belongs to us as we belong to our family. We do not own our family or treat it as commodity. Today the currency we trade in puts a set of values on our natural resources that can be easily exploited by big business and international trade without accountability for the survival of future generations locally. Before there were banks and shares and crypto coin, we ensured that our practices made the land healthy. The way that we farmed with digging stick and fire built up the topsoil so it was rich and fertile. Many generations had laid these foundations to which migrants would reap the benefits in gold and agriculture. Leaving our country upside down, parched of water, once crystal clear, now dirty, contaminated and diverted on its own path. When country is not treated as your family and you know not of Bunjil's laws, it can be exploited without limitation and without consideration of all other life forms dependent upon it. Or the people unborn who will have to heal this wound. Today we must evolve our thinking to challenge and accommodate new and foreign systems of society imposed on us and the preset values of exploitation within that system imposed on our country. Today we are trying to bring back some of the old ways of intimately working with the land that strengthens our connection and relationships as once solid foundation instrumental in forming and regulating responsibilities to country for the benefit of all. I don't know, we've got to undo a lot of these pre-programmed views of um, bringing back trade, our wakjara. And that way we enable people who perhaps weren't able to participate in this system. 
if everything comes back to money, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> One of the things back that um, I've learned over maybe 20 years, 20, 30 years of um, uh, listening to Aboriginal people in this country is the emphasis on making returns. And when I look at um, the, polit the political systems from my heritage or my current heritage, um, you have progress on the right and progressiveness on the left. And both are about a linear trajectory. Very few of them talk about the, re the cyclical, the return, the making the return and the honouring back. And I feel like um, that seems to me such a fundamental place to start with, with economy making, with culture making, for all of us to um, honour the return making that, so that we are involved in the abundance that the land can, can bear forth, but we're also involved in um, a very deliberate, and very conscious returning. Um, and that, that to me is regenerative culture. It's regenerative agriculture. And that is what I've learned from listening to yourself and many Aboriginal people and staying with Aboriginal people all around Australia. So I feel that is... Um, the, the, I mean, in terms of the, the questions that have come from the floor, I, I feel like the, the return is so missing. It's missing from our education systems. It's missing from our political systems. Um, and it's missing from our economics. How do we make the returns? What daily, day-to-day -day return making are we involved in? Can I add to that? I, I think that um, we, we've got to replace the, the notion of the fiction, the environmental fiction of comparative advantage with the principle of subsidiarity. So but what I mean by that is that comparative advantage says, you know, if you can produce wheat better in Canada, well, then we shouldn't produce it here and we should import it from Canada and we could export whatever it is we do produce well here, um, which basically destroys the resiliency, the local resiliency of any local economy, or it destroys the resiliency of local economies. Whereas subsidiarity, the principle of subsidiarity is that we produced what we can here, those things that we can't produce here, you know, we trade for, um, but everything that we can produce locally we do, as local as possible. And I think that we need to take it from just the productive sphere, sphere to the reproductive sphere as well. In other words, those way, all those ways in that we reproduce ourselves as uh, a society, a local society, we have to localize as much as possible and take uh, community control over as much as possible, or territorial control over as much as possible. Um, that, I think that's... That's what a post-capitalist society will look like. These long value chains will no longer determine our lives, um, but will be complements to the lives which we determine. It's not called the, the reloc Hepburn Relocalization Network for nothing. No. <laughs> we might um, wrap it up. Um, I'd like to just call... Um, uh, Sue Dennett in uh, to lead us uh, out and lead us into the supper room. Um, she wants to do a closing ceremony. Um, I would like to thank Beck and David and Eric very much and Eva and Tammy for offering what you have tonight. Um, I feel really rich. Um, I don't, I'm not walking away with anything that there is nothing uh, except for extremely rich material uh, for us to continue to build our lives upon. So I thank you all for that. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>
Thank you.